talk GraphQL versus traditional REST API. Uh, first of all, I would like to really thank you to, for choosing this talk because I know there are some other also very great, great talks happening at the same time. So thanks for choosing this one. Uh, also, I would like to say like I'm really honored to be here for the first time at GeekCon and then on the 10th anniversary. So it's not a small thing. So I'm really happy to be here. This doesn't work. Okay. First of all, uh, let me introduce myself. So my name is Vladimir Dianovic, and I'm part of professional IT scene since 2006. In other words, I'm getting paid for writing code and doing other stuff since 2006. I'm a founder and leader of Amsterdam Java user group, and also I'm speaker at conferences, but enough about me. Again, this talk isn't, I'm not the main subject here, right? So what this talk is going to be about, first, I'll spend some time basically talking about the REST, what REST is, more precisely more traditional REST API is. Then I'll spend some time on GraphQL, basically what a GraphQL is, why should we care or not. And the majority of talks should be some kind of comparison between them in by showing the code. Uh, there will be some time for questions at the end, so if you have any questions, please wait until the end and ask them then. Also, you can always ping me on the Twitter or email, I will be more than happy to answer any question, or you can just, you know, Grab me after this talk, I'm going to stay here. So, again, also the good thing is we have 50 minutes, so it's usually more time than I usually have for talks. So, let's start with a very simple question. What is REST? And this can sound as a very silly question, right? Because like, who writes here wrote REST API or consumed the REST API? Yeah, basically everybody, right? So then why would I ask s such obvious question, right? What is REST? Well, the reason for that is that if we would go and really ask this question to people and then gather all the responses, we would get a lot of different answers, and unfortunately, most of them would be wrong. And the reason for that is that REST has a very formal definition since it was part of doctor dissertation by Roy Fielding in 2000. If you would like to read the whole doctor dissertation, you ju can just follow this link. It's an extremely good read, so I, I really suggest you to read it, but it is extremely long because, at the end, it is doctor dissertation, so there has to be lots of pages there, right? So we're not going to go through all of it. We're just going to look at like the core of it. So in the core of it, basically, there is client-server architecture. There is a client and there is a server. Separation of concerns. Statelessness, very important thing that very often people forget. Server should know nothing about the state of a client. All the data that basically server needs to respond to the client, client needs to send in the request. Cacheability. Server should be able to say, okay, this response should be cached or not, and for how long. Layer system. Client should have no clue if it's talking directly to the server or it goes through multiple layers and, uh, until actually it reaches the server finally. Code on demand, well, this is optional, and it, in a nutshell, it means that the server can send some code to the client and client can then execute this code. And last but not the least, uniform interface. Uh, this is a very complex one, but in a nutshell, it means that basically different parts of a system can evolve independently of one another. So, all of that is nice, right? But again, like, my clients don't really care about doctor dissertations or theories or anything like that. They care about the code, which actually works, and solve some concrete problem for them. And I assume that that's the same thing for you, you know, like in your day-to-day -day job, like nobody asks you about doctor dissertation. Say, like, fix this thing or make this one. So, what's actually rest in real life? Well, usually it means there is some data source. Maybe database. And then, basically, we have our application, which actually talks to the data source or database, collects the data, and exposes it over the API. And, of course, there is a front-end which consumes this API. Sometimes this exposure of data happens field by field. So exactly as it is in the database, you just take it, you don't do any transformation, you just ship it back to the front-end. Of course, there can be much more complex situations where you have like a lot of business logic, multiple data sources, and some other system interacting, but again, just going to the data source, taking the data and shipping it out to the front end is so common that we even have a name for it. It's called crude REST APIs. And in most cases, when people talk about REST APIs, they exactly this is what they mean. They mean about crude REST APIs or how I usually call them traditional REST APIs. So let's look at this example but with some working code, right? So imagine we're building a blog and of course we have authors, right? So we'll have some database, we'll have some table, and at the table we'll have table author, and there are going to be ID and the name of the author, right? Then, of course, we'll have posts, because what's the blog post without posts? And, of course, there's going to be ID, title, body, and the ID of the author. It's going to be a little bit more complex, because we're also going to have comments. Very advanced blog, right? 
And again, comment can basically consist of ID of a text, of ID of the post to which it belongs to, and ID of the author. Uh, all my examples are written using Spring Boot and MongoDB for a very simple reason. I'm an extremely lazy person, and Spring Boot and MongoDB gives me a lot of freedom and a lot of things for free, and even if I make mistakes, they will not kill me. Uh, I'm going to use this URL throughout the, co uh, the talk, so the same URL is going to be used for all examples. I'm just going to basically use different tags, and this is already online. So let's look at, at the code. So, let me just so first thing first, oh yeah, I have a mouse, I can use this one. So first, of course, we have an author. Basically, this is the Podger implementation of our table. We have ID, and we have a name. Also, you'll see that I don't have getters and setters, and the reason for that is because I'm using Lombok, and it's, again, a very go good thing if you're a lazy person. So I just put this, and I get all the getters and setters for free. So this is the author. Of course, we have an author repository. So we also have a auto repository, and again, it's Spring Boot, it's Mongo, so I just put this, and that's it. I say, okay, my objects are type author, done deal. Then we also have post, right? Again, the same thing like a database, like a table, nothing changes, like ID, author ID, title body. We also have post repository. Again, the same thing, nothing clever here. Of course, we have to have controller. Again, because this is Spring, we have REST controller. And we have then some endpoints. Basically, we can request all the authors, or we can request author by ID, or we can request all posts. Also, there's option for me to actually filter posts according to the author ID. So again, like nothing special here, very traditional, very simple REST. Also, we have comments, and we can again filter them by post ID. So if we go and look into that one, so basically what first thing we could do basically is we can ask for all the posts. And we get all the posts, right? So basically what if we want to get information about the author, and let's say we want to see, okay, who created this post here? Well, we select author ID. And then all the thing that we need to do is get and we get information about the author and we can also then ask for all the comments for this post. And again, it works. So again, this is an extremely stupid example. But it is sufficient enough that we can actually build the whole blog post using this API. So let's not spend much more time about it. But it's just like a base. So what is GraphQL? Some time ago, actually, I also like asked this question myself, basically, what is GraphQL? And in that situation, I do what everybody else does, is, OK, you go to the Google, you type in GraphQL, and then you get all the useful information, right? So when I did it, I went to official website of GraphQL, and this is what I read. GraphQL is a query language for APIs. I didn't understand at all what this means. And I think that not a lot of people will actually understand it when they read it first time, because like, what the hell, you know? Okay. So of course, like every sane person do, I actually continue to read the data, and then I came to a very simple answer. And that is, GraphQL is a specification. Nothing more, nothing less. Just a specification. And this is extremely important thing to remember, because we as developers, we don't develop code using specifications. We rely on them. But in the end, we use implementations of a specification. And as we all know, if you have a specification, that it doesn't mean that all implementations are going to follow it. You know, just take, for example, Internet Explorer. And also, not all the implementations will implement all the things from the specification. So you need to be aware that the GraphQL is a specification. And you need to be aware that you are going to use some implementation in some programming language, JavaScript, Java, Go, PHP, whatever. There are, like, there are new implementations all the time. But you need to be aware of the limitations that they have 
and to be aware if they actually implemented the whole specification or only certain parts of it. In my examples, I'm going to use GraphQL Java because, of course, like I like Java the most. But again, talking is boring, so let's look at some code. Again, same URL, just different tag. So let me just. I'm here. Okay, so important thing that I want to show you is again, I'm still using the same author, so nothing changed from the database point of view. I'm using the same post object as it is in simple REST API. I'm using the same repository. Again, so all the things to connect to the database are exactly the same. I haven't changed a single thing. I'm reusing them all as they are. So basically, what the hell? Where actually the difference is, is first, yeah, is this one. So by the way, I hope the, the font is big enough. It's big? Yeah. Okay, so this is basically the GraphQL schema. And this is a very important part of the GraphQL, because basically here you define all the types that you're going to use in your, basically, talk to, to the front end and how you, they can interact with it. So here I say, okay, you have, I have a type called author, which is of has a field ID of a type ID and name of a type string. So if I go quickly to the author, you can see that it is exactly the same like the one in the database. Uh, important thing that I want to mention here is this basically exclamation mark. Exclamation mark means that this field is mandatory. So whenever basically author is going to appear, this field has to be present. If there is a null, it's going to crash. Again, I define type post, exactly the same do, like basically I, I did uh, with the database. So there is ID of type ID, title of type string, body of type string, and author ID of the type string. So exactly the same like, the, like a table. The same thing with the comment, so I will not go through it. And now here we come to the heart of the GraphQL and that schema. Basically. Above, I say, okay, I'm going to use these types in, in my basically GraphQL, but here I actually say, okay, like this is where the users can interact with my GraphQL API. So this is basically the heart of the GraphQL schema. And here I say I'm going to have query of type query, and below I have a definition of, I hope everybody sees it, hopefully if I can just put it up. So here I define type query as all posts, which is of type array of posts. So this type, from the GraphQL point of view, is exactly the same like all other types. But we'll see the difference basically later on. Important thing that I want to also mention here is whenever you see query in GraphQL, it means read only. Again, you can use different names for instead of query. You don't have to use the name query. It's still going to work but it is better if everybody uses the same names because then when you just open the schema, you know, okay, query, that's read-only. And again, like I would like to stress read-only, so don't change the data, although you can. Just don't be naughty. So how this actually then works? For that, uh, let's go quickly to the this one. So basically, this is my main Spring Boot application, and here I just defined the servlet in a standard way like any other server basically in a Spring Boot. And I say on this endpoint, slash GraphQL, just call this servlet. Okay, and then let's look in this one. Basically for this servlet, I am saying, okay, just extend simple GraphQL servlet. So in my code, I'm using GraphQL Java, but I'm using also some other library which actually helps me in a more user-friendly way to actually map the GraphQL schema and wire it to the Java code. You can also do it directly through the GraphQL Java but it's just going to take you more time and it's then not that nice to look at, so I prefer this one, especially for demos. Here, basically, I don't do a lot of stuff. Again, a lot of things are going to be done for me automatically. What I need to do, I need to basically create schema parser, say, new, okay, new parser, provide here with basically with the schema that I'm using, so this is the schema that I already showed you. Then, interesting thing is, I'm going to basically here, add resolvers, build it, and make it executable. And that's it, nothing else. 
So basically, what does this thing here resolvers do? Again, I have Java code. Actually, I have this schema. And I need somehow to, to wire it to my Java code. So the resolvers are exactly what, what they actually need to use. And if you see here, I have a resolver of the name query, which is exactly the same like this font type here. And this is not coincidence. This is on purpose. So basically, this way, my Java code understand what's basically wired to what part of the GraphQL scheme. Again, the same thing with here. All the names, comment, post, author, they're all the names of my pages. Again, on purpose so that my Java code understand where to wire according to the GraphQL schema. So what does a query does? Well, not a lot. The only thing that you need to do is say, OK, implement GraphQL root resolver. So basically saying, OK, this resolver. And we have one method called all posts, which is going to return list of posts. And again, if you go back to schema, we have all posts which return array of posts. So this is how, basically, my Java code understand how to wire up, basically, on the GraphQL schema. So what does all this originally mean in the end? So it means that I can go here, and I can actually start, hopefully, oh, I lost the internet, so this is going to be fun. Woohoo! And I, I have dependencies on JavaScript, so. There's a first time for everything, right? This work. The good thing is we have 50 minutes, so even if something goes wrong, like. I'm not sure why I'm losing connection all the time. OK, I'm back. So here I'm going to use uh, GraphQL, eventually. Yeah. And this is basically uh, one nice tool that you can use for a playground to actually like play with the GraphQL APIs. And here I can actually create a query. So I can say query. And you see that I have autocomplete for free. I'll come to back later. And I can ask for all posts. And then I can, of course, ask all the fields, ID, title, body, and author ID. And if I click run, OK, voila, here's all the data. Exactly the same like the rest API. So not really a big deal. The nice thing is that I also get the documentation for free. So if I click here, I can basically see that I have query of type query. And type query basically has all posts of type posts. So I can see the GraphQL schema throughout this one. Also, because of that, I have autocomplete. One nice thing that I get for free is that I can just remove, for example, these two fields and run it. And I still get all the data filtered out immediately. First, I saw this, I said, like, yeah, so what's the point? Like, this is not really that difficult. I can do it myself in any REST API. So let's continue. So first thing first, I would like to check how the GraphQL actually goes according to definition of the REST. So the client-server architecture, yes, I showed you the client and the server. Statelessness, well, I use the simple Java servlet, so if I write code in the correct way, it will be statelessness. Cacheability, same answer. Layered system. Well, yes. Code on demand. Well, code on demand was optional anyway, so who cares? And uniform interface. Well, I showed you the GraphQL schema, and that's the heart of the GraphQL. So again, I would say big yes. So GraphQL is nothing more than basically the REST API. It's very advanced REST API, and we'll come back to that. But again, in a nutshell, it is a REST API. So let's come first, basically, and come back to the simple REST, right? With REST, schema is optional, right? You can create the schema. You can generate the code from the schema. Or then basically, yeah, then you can, or you can actually write the code, generate schema from it, or you can completely ignore schema altogether, and everything is still going to work. Because in the end, it is optional. Nothing will break. It is extremely good practice to have schema. And I urge you to always have schema, because it's going to help you in the long run. But again, even if you don't have it, everything will work. And this is the big difference uh, to the GraphQL. Because with GraphQL, schema is mandatory. You must have it. So you can, again, do two things. You can do like I did, basically create the schema, and then create the code which is going to be wired to the schema. Or you can basically create the code, and then basically from the code, 
generate the schema. But either way, you must have schema, or it will not work. And the reason for that is simple. If you have a client, basically, and a server, a REST, a basic GraphQL API, what happens is that the client will ask for API, say, okay, like, can you give me the schema? And that's basically what Graph GraphQL actually did. And GraphQL API is going to say, okay, here's my schema, and here is everything defined. The types that I'm going to use, how the request should look like, and how response will look like. Every same client will actually then save that schema somewhere, and then basically do validation of every request that goes to the API before it's sent. Because why it's, what's the point of sending the invalid request? Again, if you are naughty and you basically force an API or basically you just use simple or curl to send invalid request, what server is going to do is going to just validate your request before any work is done according to the schema. And that's all that's going to happen. So every request, every response before API even starts processing or sending to the client is validated according to schema. If it's not valid, it will just send back the error and like no work will be done. So that's why you have to have schema because the client needs to understand what type of request should go to the server. If we talk about advanced APIs, we will have to talk about H2S. So anybody know what H2S is? Okay, then like half people. Uh, basically, uh, the idea behind H2S is advanced REST API, which is explorable and uh, self-explanatory like a website. So uh, just imagine, when you go to a certain website, you don't know what's there. You don't know what the connection between the pages are, what are all the posts and internal things. But you just go there, you browse, you click through, and you basically get all the connections. You read the articles, and you go from one thing to basically to relate a thing. The H2S is the same thing, but for APIs. And this is what I actually meant when I said that the GraphQL is advanced REST API. So let's look into it. Again, same URL, different tag. Oh, I forgot to actually bring the tag. Here. So what I changed is just one small thing. I just changed this line, nothing else. So basically what I said here is okay, my post has a field created by, and it's of type author, nothing else. So let me check if this one is open or anything. Okay, so this one is open or anything. So if we go here, okay, so I can say here created by, and I get ID and name. So voila, it works. How it works? Well, magic doesn't exist, so let's look. Did I basically change the post? No. Post is exactly the same as like it was. So no changes here. Okay, maybe I changed post repository. No. Again, it's exactly the same. Maybe I changed query, right? Because the query was basically the one for fetching the data. Again, no. It is exactly the same. The only thing that I changed, part of the schema, is that uh, that basically here, I added another resolver. Again, like I said, I'm wiring basically the Java code to my schema. So I needed one more resolver to actually make that connection. And if we open this new resolver, you're going to see that it's of type implements GraphQL resolver compared to the query, which is root resolver. So that's the difference. Query is root resolver because it's on, on top, so that's why it's called the root resolver. Post resolver is basically resolver somewhere in the graph. That's why it's just called GraphQL resolver. You see that here I said type post. So basically this is how I tell to my Java code, okay, whenever you need to resolve certain field, basically for the type post, you can call me. Because in theory what actually GraphQL does is whenever somebody requests something of type post and some field, it checks first, okay, does the post has that field? ID, yes, title, yes, body, yes, created by, no, I don't have it. So where do I then go? I can't go to the pojo. So then it actually looks for the resolvers, find resolver, which actually in that way in this way, and then checks, okay, does this resolver has field which I need? Method created by, takes an argument post, return back to the author. Yes, it does, cool. I'll call this one and job done. And that's basically all the magic to it. Nothing fancy. Okay, let's go this one. So in the past, basically, in the first version, I had something like this, right? I have a client, and I had post, author, and comment, but I can only talk 
with my client to the post, nothing else. Then I create a connection between basically the post and the author, and then I could, whenever I request for a certain post, I could also get appropriate author. But why stay here, right? We can just expand this much more. So let's connect author and the post, post and comment, comment and post, and comment and author. So it's now looks like a graph, right? So that's basically from where actually the name GraphQL actually comes from, because you're actually having the types and you're cre uh, creating connections between them and they are graphs. So again, talking is boring, let's look at the code. Same URL, different tag. So, uh, nice things, nice for the schema. Okay, so now the schema is going to be a little bit more different. So now I have an author and I added field of name posts, which will return a list of posts. I also added comments, basically to the post, which will return a list of comments. Comment also has created by of type author and belong to the post. And again, if we, hopefully this one is now up and running. By the way, I have, I have to refresh so that basically my GraphQL gets the new schema so that I actually then I get all autocomplete everything in my queries. So now I can request all the posts, right? And we can see, okay, let's give me comments. And I get text. And I can create it by. And I can get the name. And again, it works. So now it's a little bit more complex. Now you can see that why this is really advanced API. Why it's not really, and where is basically the difference compared to traditional REST APIs. You get a lot of things for free, almost free. And if you, again, go back to the code, the only two things that I need to change is basically, again, resolvers. So I added auto resolver, comment resolver, and I extended post resolver. So if we open somewhere here. So if we okay. My Eclipse a little bit is behind with the code. Again, I added again GraphQL resolver of for type author, field posts, author ID, and all the others are basically in the same way. So you you just build upon it, you just continue as it was. So now, when we come back to the original definition of the GraphQL, and which says GraphQL is a query language for APIs, I think that we are all now all understand what actually it means. Or well, the first time we saw it, it was like, what the hell? The uh, original idea behind the GraphQL was actually to be used in something like this, in some way like this. So basically you have some APIs in the back end, you have some other systems in the back end, maybe legacy systems, you have some data sources, databases, all kinds of things. And then in front of all of that, you put a GraphQL API, which actually connects in the back end to all those systems, and then expose the data through the rich query language of the GraphQL to all the users in front. And you saw it is very advanced, it's, it's very rich. You can do really crazy stuff with it. And I even didn't show even the half of the things that you can do. So again, the big difference between GraphQL and traditional REST API is that GraphQL for free gives you very powerful query language. So you can do the filtering, you can do connections, you can basically uh, do the if statements in your query. If such a certain basically request is valid or not, basically give me this piece of code or not. You can actually also put uh, parameters inside it and actually carry variables. You can use the snippets of the code inside other queries. So you can really go nuts with it. It is extremely powerful and this is one of the big differences compared to traditional REST APIs. Because of all this craziness that users can do, also client called the shots. Because if you remember, in traditional REST API, basically we said, okay, this is the endpoint that you can call, this is the way you can call them, and this is how response will look like. So we were in the full control. We knew exactly where the users can go, how they can go, for which piece of the code they can go, what they can going to do. With the GraphQL, we have no clue. Only thing that we know is that we have certain types, we have connections between them, we can expose them and say, okay, like this is what we have, this is what we can give you, but uh, basically what you're going to do with it, it's completely up to you. And this isn't a small thing, and you never underestimate this one. Again, big difference compared to traditional REST APIs. And if you go back to my simple example of a blog post, there is one big problem with this one. And the problem is that here I have cyclic dependency. 
So you might say like, okay, so, so what, right? Not a big deal. Well, what if somebody by mistake or on purpose sent me a query like this? It's absolutely very qu valid query. The problem is basically here. So this can go on and on and on and on and on forever. And my GraphQL API will say, okay, like, okay, this is valid response. I'll try and do it. And then it will crash. So GraphQL basically is very, can be very talkative. Again, in my example, if somebody requests from the post and requests the author, if that code isn't basically required, it will not be called. But if somebody requires that author, it's going to be called. And again, if I have author who created thousands of requests, thousands of posts, that call will be made a thousand times. Not really efficient. So there's a very easy ways that basically people can abuse your GraphQL API. So how can we protect ourselves? Well, the most easy thing that we can do is just create timeout, right? If request isn't processed in a certain period of time, we just send back, okay, timeout to the client. But this doesn't really solve the problem. And the reason why is because, again, although the client will get a timeout, in the background, our CPU and memory is still going to be consumed. So the better thing that we can do is say, okay, this is the maximum query depth. If re you remember what I started at the beginning said, okay, when the query, GraphQL query gets the request, it checks validity according to the schema. So in that part, we can also make a say, okay, this is the maximum query depth that you can go. If it's above this, just don't do it. It's too expensive. More, even more better thing that we can do is basically say, okay, max query complexity. Because again, like if we say, okay, you can go only certain depth in the query, what somebody can do is then attack you in the width. And again, you still have the same problem. Uh, max query depth is more complex to actually implement than timeouts, but it's better protection. Max query complexity is even more complex to implement, but it's even better protection. And again, the idea is you check again the whole query. Look what the complexity of that one is by basically giving scores for every query, every part of a possible query. You sum all those values, and if it's bigger than some number, just say, go away. It's too expensive. But this one is difficult to implement and also difficult to maintain. Because, for example, when you're writing certain parts of code, you know what the complexity is. But imagine, three months so later, somebody changed something, something else changed. Is the complexity still the same? You can even now understand what the complexity is. The best, but the most complex protection to put is throttling. Basically, Every period of time, give to every request a certain amount of memory, a certain amount of CPU. That's the best possible protection, but the most complex one to implement. And here we come back to the start of the talk where I said, okay, GraphQL is a specification, and you're going to use implementation. So certain implementations have some of these protections already baked in, some have none, some have some. So again, you need to be aware what is the implementation that you're using, what the things are inside it, and what the things you need to do for yourself. Uh, GraphQL query uh, consists of three big parts. The first part is basically querying or reading only data, and I think I talked about it more than enough. But as we all know, reading only data is not fun. At some point, we need to change the data, and there is actually where the mutations come into place. The difference between query and mutation is because qu query is read only. When you send multiple query requests, it will be run in parallel with mutation because they are changing the data, changing the state. It will be run sequentially. So let's look at the code again. Okay. Again, we go back to schema, the heart of everything, the beginning of everything. So here, so everything else is exactly the same, only this part here changed. I added mutations by the name of a mutation. Again, you can use whatever name you want as long as it matches the one in the Java code. But again, better use the standard one so everybody understand. Mutation for type mutation. Mutation has basically add author, which actually takes argument name of a type string, and it returns back the author. We have another one, which basically is remove the author, which takes ID, and returns back the author. This is the standard, by the way, this is the standard way to actually send parameters to the queries in, in GraphQL. It doesn't matter if it's like query or mutation, it's done in the same way. So if we go back here, first of all, let me just show you. Oh, oh uh, again, I need to refresh. Beautiful. Let's go on. 
and this internet holds. Maybe not. Maybe yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's go for all authors and see if we have the ID and the name. So this is all the authors at the moment which I have. So let me add another one. So again, I go mutation, add author, name. And voila, it works. So how do I make it happen? Again, not really a lot of change was needed. The only thing that was needed was basically here to add this resolver, nothing else. Everything else is exactly the same like it was. And if we open mutation, basically it implements GraphQL root resolver, exactly the same like query. So the query was GraphQL root resolver, mutation, with GraphQL root resolver. And reason for that is because they are in here, basically in the schema, the heart of GraphQL schema. In case of mutation, basically I have a method called add author, takes argument of the name type, name of the type string, returns back the author, and also remove author, takes the ID, and returns back the author. And again, because I have to use exactly the same name like in the schema, so that my Java code and the schema can basically get connected together. The third part of, of the GraphQL API is subscription, and I'm not going to show you the demo of this one. Uh, idea behind the subscription is very simple, and that's basically you send certain requests to the API, and you like, like a query, and you just say, okay, I want to get this type of information, and then instead of getting just one response back from the client, you're getting back the stream of responses. And GraphQL basically originated from the Facebook, so my guess is that probably they needed something to like get all the face, uh, friends updates and things like that. So this was the use case. But again, not all implementations basically implemented this part. So there are some questions that you probably would like to ask yourself about the GraphQL. And the first is, of course, that at least that I ask, okay, like, but what do we do with the errors? Because with the traditional REST APIs, we basically used the status, HTTP statuses and things like that. And here is like whatever you do, like you're always going to get status 200. Well, again, the good thing about uh, the GraphQL that it is a specification, so somebody thought about it. So if you go and do some crazy stuff like this, actually, yeah, why not? Basically, you're going to see that there is a part of the response which is data, which is filled in when the request is valid. And in the case the request is not valid or something crashed on the server, you will have part error. And here is going to be basically information about, okay, what went wrong. Of course, you can customize this. So the good thing about this approach is that you don't have to go into long discussions, okay, how do you approach errors, which status codes to use, what type of information to send back, how to structure it, because somebody already thought it for you, which is a good thing. Yeah. The next thing, again, like I talked a little bit with uh, my use case, for example, we had like one author who created 100 posts, and then for every post I'm going to call again database and ask information for the author, is performance and cache. So what do we do with performance and cache? Again, the GraphQL doesn't really care about performance and cache. It's a specification. It is up to implementation to deal with it and you. So from the GraphQL point of view, does nothing is solved. Some implementations already baked solutions for you. Somewhere you will have to do everything yourself. What about authentication and authorization? Another very important part of the APIs. Again, GraphQL as a GraphQL doesn't care. But some implementations of a GraphQL basically give you some hooks that you can very easily plug in and actually then do authorization authentication yourself. Somewhere there is no information at all, you have to do it basically from the ground up. In most cases, they use custom context and then basically you, there's a very, at least in GraphQL Java, there's a very easy way to actually connect, uh, connect custom context to authorization and authentication so you can really solve it in a very easy way. Okay, so let's sum up. GraphQL versus traditional REST API. As you saw, they're extremely similar. Again, GraphQL is basically very advanced REST API. But of course, they're not one-to-one. -one. Uh, you can do absolutely everything that GraphQL gives you 
in a traditional REST API yourself, but then you'll have to think about a lot of things, a lot of use cases, how you actually send the parameters, how you actually filter data, how you do all kinds of things. With GraphQL, that's already taken care of. When you come to tools and knowledge, well, REST APIs are part of our scene much more, much so longer than basically the doctor dissertation about that. So they were like built long, long, long time ago. So the, the knowledge that people have, the tools, the ecosystem, all the frameworks around it, and all the kind of things is ridiculously big. With the in the case of GraphQL, it's not the case. The frameworks doesn't support it that much that at the moment. There are not that many tools, there are not .NET. There is not that much knowledge. But again, the GraphQL is getting more and more recognition and it's used more and more widely. So of course the tools are becoming better, there are more implementations, the frameworks are picking it up. So it's speeding up. It's not on the level of the traditional REST, but it's not really bad either. Very good uh, thing about the GraphQL, because it's very similar to the traditional REST API, is that a lot of problems and things that you will encounter in day-to-day -day life can be solved using the old tricks, just using the very traditional old tricks for the traditional REST API. For example, in case of caching, you can just, instead of going directly fr from the uh, resolver to the database, you can just create a service, like in tr any traditional Spring application, and then just call the service, and then just cache the, the response from the service. And more or less, that's something that you will do with traditional REST API anyway. So a lot of old tricks can work like one-to-one, -one, or you just need to tweak them a little bit, and then they're going to solve all your problems again. Uh, GraphQL has extremely powerful language, and this is big difference between, like I said, traditional REST API and GraphQL. Like I said, I didn't show you even half of the possibilities of the GraphQL, so I really urge you to go and read more and see what options are there out, out there. Again, like I said, do you have to use GraphQL to get all those kind of features? No, you can do it yourself. I've been involved in certain projects where actually APIs that we built were traditional REST APIs, but we had a lot of features that basically GraphQL gives you for free. The good thing is if you use GraphQL, there is a specification, there is no arguing, well, let's do it this way or that way. This one is better, that one is better. Hello? You hear me all? Okay. Uh, this one is better, that one is better. So that's a good thing. But again, you don't have to use it to get all the benefits. Oh, this is the other way around. Uh, also, important thing about GraphQL is that it has an extremely rich uh, SDL, schema definition language. Again, if you do a lot of development with the APIs, then you, will prob you probably know about the Swagger, Open API Spec, RAML, API Blueprint. All those kind of things, and all those kind of tools are very good. They have good ecosystem, a lot of tools behind them and everything. But again, if I compare them to the GraphQL, GraphQL SDL is much richer. It allowed me actually to do a lot of things that in a very easy way from the start that in other specifications for APIs was a very difficult thing to do. So you can also define the scholars. You don't have to, in my case, didn't define new scholars, but you can also create interfaces so that you can use them in basically like inherited similar like in Java. Uh, you can use also unions, which is very useful when you have an endpoint which can actually return different types of responses. And again, if you try to define that in, for example, in uh, all other tools that I mentioned, it's going to be a pain. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? What are the implementations of this? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? The implementations? Uh, so the question was, what were the implementations? So I know that uh, Facebook, of course, because they built it, they, there's an implementation in JavaScript for React. In uh, Java, there are at least two minimum implementations. There's GraphQL Java implementation. There's also SPQR, which actually goes in a different direction. So you just add annotations, and then from that, you generate basically the schema. And I don't know for that, but they're constantly coming new and new ones. So there's also a question there. There's a mic. Yeah, you described uh, like uh, GraphQL as very cool stuff, like take my money and give it to me. but. Uh, I mean, where is the catch? Uh, there should be, it can be silver bullets, so there no, should be cases uh, when, for instance, REST API is much better and much suitable. Uh, th this is first question. Um, and second question is, uh, I actually forgot it, so let's go with this. <laughs> okay, so, so, the, so the first question about silver bullet. Uh, GraphQL 
is cool, but it's not Silver Bullet, of course, and there's, of course, problems with it. Uh, the first big problem is that you can really, like I said, shoot yourself in the foot very easily. So if you don't understand the logic behind it, and that's why actually I showed you basically like abuses those, those kind of things, uh, you can really create something and then people will actually crash you. So you have to understand the logic behind it, not the whole logic, but at least the basics. Another problem that also I mentioned is uh, the tools and knowledge. So the, the, the tools basically that other people are going to use, for example, for testing, for actually connecting, everything, it's not on the level of, of the traditional REST APIs. Because if you take traditional REST API, whatever tool you actually want to use, you can use with it. All the frameworks can interact with it, like all the frameworks, like the mobile applications, front end, like whatever, everything will work out of the box with traditional REST API because it's just simple, usually just simple Ajax call and that's it. In case of GraphQL, it's not the case. So you have to basically use something that actually also on the front end understand the GraphQL. And again, depending on your use case, on your stack, on what technologies you can use or not, maybe you will not be able to use it. Again, another problem that actually I noticed in, in my own personal experience is that you have a big systems and the front end is done, the back end is done, and you say, okay, like GraphQL is really cool, let's use it, it's going to actually make our life much easier in the long run. The people that are not always happy to go with that route. And one of the things is, well, yeah, but then I have to like rewrite the half of the application and I don't want to do it. So it's not a silver bullet. It's a very cool thing. It's something that's going to, in my mind, become bigger and bigger because it's very useful. Will it kill over it, everything else and just take over the world? No. Any more questions? Uh, hi. Uh, so yep. how does uh, GraphQL deal with uh, schema changes in underlying services? Uh, from the, that's a very good question. And uh, basically it comes back to whoever is developing it. So whoever is actually developing the code, whoever is developing the API, that pers that person, that people actually need to make sure to stay backwards compatible. Because again, like I showed you uh, the exclamation mark, which actually means this field is mandatory. Which means that again, in theory, if you remove that field, front end then needs to make the changes. The good thing about that one uh, compared to traditional REST API is, is that the client will actually understand that the schema has changed and the schema will not, is not valid anymore according to its code and it will not send a request or it will get very easily, okay, like this thing changed. But again, it still comes back with the problem that the front end needs to actually and everybody in the front end, whoever is using it, needs to catch up with it. So there, it's more tools to actually to help you catch the problem earlier and to actually see where what's changed, but again, it doesn't really solve it. Again, you have to think about it when you design it, when you change it, how you communicate to other people. So there isn't there any special solution for that one at the moment. Uh, uh, the ID fields has a separate type, ID. What is the reason that there is an ID type? Uh, idea behind ID is basically from the graphical point of view, it's a string, but it's a string that you shouldn't uh, look at as a human being. So that's why they find it as an ID. So it means, okay, this is the ID. This is something which will identify this entity. And again, we are going to use it as a string. So it's whatever you put there, it will work. But don't look at it as a human being. It's only for machines. So that's the reason for ID. Uh, here's Blue. Okay, you said that this is REST compatible. But in RESTful world, we usually have uh, a resource identifier, which you can use to access the resource, right? So here you have some queries, and those queries are not, may not return the same results whenever you uh, try to use them, right? Uh, okay, so the question is uh, basically, if we use IDs, specific IDs, in the REST API, we'll always get the same result, right? In this case, no. Uh, again, it comes back how you actually define your endpoints. So you can also, like I said in my case, give me all posts, and then of course, like whatever is the database you're going to get, but you can also put there like, okay, get me post by this ID, and then basically put parameter of ID, and then again, you're either going to get that ID, basically that same post back, or not. So it, it comes back basically again how to actually define the schema. Does that answer your question? Okay, anything else? <coughs> They're in the back. Um, hi, what about API versioning? Is it a part of specification or? Mm, no, no, at least as far as I'm aware, no. But again, I'm not really the core developer of the implementations or the specs, so 
I'm like developers like you guys. So as far as I know, no, there is no any versioning baked inside it. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, hi, uh, how to deal with pagination in GraphQL? Uh, with pagination? Uh, again, uh, it comes back to, like I said, uh, let me show you the code. Uh, so, again, like when you create a query, basically, just imagine that this was query. Uh, query, yeah, whatever, query. And basically, then here, you would basically send parameter, for example, page, size, whatever, and that basically this parameter is going to be forwarded to the backend, and then the backend needs to deal with it. So again, adding the any arguments there, it's up to you. So you can, again, if you say all posts, in my case, it would basically literally go take everything and just ship it back, which is in case of having a lot of posts, not a good thing. So that's again, again, you have to think about it. When somebody doesn't give you any parameter, do you send the whole data or you send just like the part of the data? Again, you can also add here parameter and say, okay, like you can say to me how much elements you want, which page you want. So it's basically up to you in most cases. From the GraphQL point of view, it doesn't really care. You just say, okay, add parameters that we're going to deal with pagination, and then in the back end, you, you decide what you do with that. Okay, so I have to mm, validate in, in backend, yes? Yeah. Um, and I can't do something like rest, then I return first uh, 20 results and say uh, for next part, uh, go to this URL. Well, it's not really go to this URL, but you can say I just send back some index or something. Uh, again, it, it really it can be done in multiple ways, but again, it is really up to you. So how you're going to implement it. Really, GraphQL, from, like I said, it's a specification, we just say, okay, this is the types, this is basically the fields that are in types, this is basically the parameters that can be sent to those types, and that's it. GraphQL doesn't really go any deeper than that. Any deeper than that is basically up to implementation and up to you. Thanks. Okay. I think we're done with time, yeah. So, if you have any other questions, you can always find me or ping me. Thank you. <laughs>